A very buggy evening to everyone. Welcome to the daily wrap up and Q&A for Bama Bugfest on the web for the Moss and Butterflies Day. Today, Saturday, July 18th. We have been collecting all of your questions and comments about the event content during the day and we'll be asking our panel of experts to help us answer as many as we can. These daily wrap-ups happen live every day of Bama Bookfest on the web at 7 p.m. Central Time. I have a quick announcement before we announce, uh, before we introduce and meet our, our panel joining us this evening about the Bama Bookfest art contest. The submission form for the art contest is now closed. We want to thank all of those who submitted, um, who sent in submissions. We're very excited to review them. Uh, the committee is now reviewing all of these submissions, and we will be submitting up to five from each age group to be released on our social media sites for a public vote. Those will be posted on Monday. So please tune in and like and subscribe to each of our organization sites to vote for your favorite. Again, the Bama Bookfest contest is closed, but voting uh, will commence on Monday. I'm Catherine Edge, director of the Warner Transportation Museum, member of the Bugfest Committee, and your moderator for the Q&A sessions this week. We are joined this evening by Dr. John Friel, director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History, Ali Sorley, education outreach coordinator at the Alabama Museum of Natural History, and Haley Bryant, youth services manager for the Tuscaloosa Public Library. You might recognize them from the programs we've had throughout the day. They've been kind enough to agree to come back this evening for a quick Q&A session. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for helping us with the event today. Uh, John, how did everything go? I think it went really well. I mean, I, you know I'm very passionate about moths, so I love talking about them. Um, so hopefully I was able to convey my enthusiasm and recruited some new people that actually may think about moths um, in a way they've never thought about them before. Fantastic. Allie, um, general thoughts about the uh, the day? Yeah, I mean, I thought it went great. Moths are an, moths and butterflies is an, is an excellent um, topic for us. And uh, I was lucky enough to get to um, moderate the programs today. So I got to learn a ton um, from both Dr. Friel and Dr. Knight, our guests today. So, And I don't have my example, but I also made a butterfly craft from Haley's video. I just, I don't have it with me right now. And I don't know why I didn't go get it, but anyway, but it was great and I had a good time. Fantastic. And um, Haley, any uh, any comments, uh, any comments about the day? Yeah, today was pretty awesome. Who knew there were so many different species? I mean, both moths and butterflies. <laughs> there are a ton. <laughs> I was about to say, reading over some of the comments, even I'm going, Really? Is that a typo? Are there supposed to be that many zeros? That can't be right. Um, <laughs> well, uh, they, they, thank you all, thank you all for that brief, uh, brief overview. Uh, overview. Uh, let's jump into uh, into some of our uh, comments and questions. If you're tuning in um, and have a couple of questions that you think of during the segment, please feel free to uh, stick them in the comment section and we will address as many of them as we can. If you have a question for one of our presenters who is not able to join us this evening, don't be shy about a question um, that you may have thought of from those previous segments. Please still submit it. Let us know specifically who it's for, and we will make sure to get those comments and questions to the right individual and get an answer for you. So just um, yeah, feel free to feel free to comment whenever you think of a question, either for our panel or for anyone who was on a segment during the day. Um, we have a couple of comments from our 10 o'clock segment that was a very hungry caterpillar and a butterfly craft. Um, so the concept of the program was um, more or less if you had, um, if you ever had a teacher that took you into a younger classroom to read uh, read a book to that to that younger classroom, that was more or less what the segment was about. Um, Allie, can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah. Uh, so when we were planning the schedule for Bugfest, we knew that story time was going to play pretty heavily, um, you know, because of our wonderful partners at the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Um, and so we thought it might be an interesting idea. And I think actually, Catherine, this idea came from you to have a kid read a story to the kids, um, which is genius and perfect and wonderful. Um, and I feel like we couldn't have butterflies and moth day without reading a very hungry caterpillar because... I don't, I mean, that's like the book about caterpillars, right? Um, that everyone loves. And so we had a, 
a friend of ours, a uh, kid, Judah, was kind enough to read the book to us, and uh, he did a great job. And he was, he's such a, I love the inflection in his voice for some of these things. And like when the caterpillar on Saturday, when he eats all of those things and he keeps like the, Judah's voice keeps rising, like a lollipop, a sausage, like it keeps <laughs> rising up. It's just, it's perfect. So it was a lot of fun to listen to. It was even more fun to edit because they got to hear it over and over and over again. And there's a chance that I might have that book memorized by now, but I feel like Haley might also have that book memorized or have read it more than once. I have that book yeah. memorized as well, Allie. It's you do too, John. It's my son's favorite. I was about to say, any, any it, it gets any read at least once or twice toddler, every day in our household. <laughs> yes. I would say, I, I think any household that has uh, any uh, children that are toddler aged or older is yeah, probably knows the the Very Hungry Caterpillar forwards, backwards, and um, can start in the middle and pick up at, at any at any point. <laughs> um, but uh, it's uh, I'm uh, I'm so glad that the the segment worked out worked out well. And um, again, you know, please please go check out Judah reading a Very Hungry Caterpillar. Um, there was a, a really, really cute butterfly craft that went along with that. Um, Haley, had had you done this particular butterfly butterfly craft before? Yeah, so I I, I did it. Um, little Haley with all the glue on her fingers doing it. Um, but then I did it again probably last year in one of my story times, and we had a really good time. Uh, but this was the first time I ever did it with the, the coffee filter. I usually just do it with colored tissue paper that use stuff in presents. So I thought this would be a really fun way to color and then wash all of the paint off or I guess the marker off and see what happens. I will say my hands were really red for a whole day after <laughs> doing it. Uh, it was just really fun to see all the bleed together. Um, and it's just fun to kind of, I have mine clipped on in my office on my little light. So every time I turn on my light, it shines all the pretty colors through. So. <laughs> I, I love the end too, where you had the toilet paper tube or the cardboard tube and it was like the cocoon. Oh, that was such yeah. a good idea. It was cute. Yeah, I thought that was really fun. I didn't get to give those in the little bags that are at the library, um, but I figured we are all stocking up on toilet paper right now. So I'm sure there's plenty of toilet paper tubes to go around in households. <laughs> Yes, I think most parents have plenty of toilet paper and also plenty of coffee filters as well. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure right now if there's more coffee being consumed in alcohol uh, um, in a uh, household or wine, but we'll just leave that up to <laughs> each individual household. Um, uh, Haley, you also mentioned that if people didn't have the materials for the craft at home, that they could stop by the main Tuscaloosa Library branch for a butter cra butterfly craft kit. Is that is that right? Yeah, there are still tons available. A lot of people have picked some up, but we have a lot on our butt fest table in the front. And That's it has everything that you need besides the markers and the water. So everything should be in there so you can make a cute little butterfly too. Well, that is fantastic. And um, is there uh, what what other things for uh, for bug fest are available at the at the library? So we still have some of the, the Build-A-Bug from Sadie's Storytime a couple weeks ago. So you can build your own awesome bug. That's still laying on the table. We have lots of really cool books. Actually, today I read one about backyard bugs that you can find in your backyard. So a lot of really cool reads so that you can snatch them up and learn some more other than what you're being taught every single every single session. So some fun, fun stories. That's absolutely fantastic. So there's uh, lots of... Lots of uh, reading material, but then also specific materials for Bama Bug Fest available at the main branch of the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Um, so a call out to our, our viewership. If anyone has any examples of their butterfly craft, we encourage you to share them on our pages in the next week so that we can see your beautiful butterflies. And I love um, I love that you, you mentioned that you have yours clipped to your desk light so that it it shines, the, the light shines through and just makes it that much, that much more enjoyable. <laughs> so that's a fantastic idea. So again, call out to the viewership. Um, please share your butterfly craft um, pictures with us. We'd love to see them. Yeah. Um, so uh, moving, uh, moving on to our, our two o'clock segment, which was uh, butterflies are moths, but moths aren't butterflies. Um, Bama Bug Fest started as a moth event, so today's theme seems very, very appropriate to the origins of the event. Um, John, I know you mentioned in uh, mentioned it in your introduction video, but could you remind us quickly how 
how everything got started. Sure. Um, I arrived at UA in 2015 and um, got here. There were already established programs, but I really wanted to do something uh, new. And uh, I had been, prior to coming to UA, I, I used to do a lot of international travel, particularly in Africa. And when I got here, I was kind of limited to Alabama. I really couldn't travel much outside the state. But so I was looking for outlets for my curiosity about nature. And about the same time, um, I, my, my wife became pregnant. I was looking for things where I could stay at home at night. Um, and I realized, you know, with my, I looked out my front window and there were moths. And I was thinking, hmm, I really don't know anything about moths, but I wonder if they're interesting. So it really started that simply of me just turning on my porch light at night, going out and saying, hmm, that's an interesting looking moth I haven't seen before. And then, like I do, I start getting on the internet and looking for resources to identify it and slowly took some baby steps and figured out how I could start documenting it. And I just kind of got hooked on it where I was doing it almost every single night. I would turn the light on at dusk, right before I went to bed, turn it off. And uh, I'd just start photographing the moths and, and posting them on various sites. So I got started that way and then I realized there was a whole um, universe of people out there that had similar interests. It's, it's like many things where you're like, when you first get into something, I must be the only one that's into this, but almost every subject, there's whole communities and many of them now are online and there are well-established moth enthusiast groups online on social media. Uh, so I realized there was the potential there. And I also discovered at the same time, there was um, an annual event, the National Moth Week that happens usually the third week of every July. It's an international event. Often there are both public and private events. And there was an opportunity to engage the public. The idea was uh, some, some of these were run by other museums, other institutions. So we could do that here. So the very first one we did in 2016 at Manville Archaeological Park. Um, it's um, one of our UA museum sites in, uh, just across the part of it in Tuscaloosa, but the bulk of it's in Hale But I knew it was kind of surrounded by woods. I thought it would be an interesting place. And then as you saw in Dr. Knight's presentation, there's this connection with the uh, moth creature that appears in the moth disc that's on display in the Jones Archaeological Museum. So I thought it would be a perfect site because for millennia, uh, human beings have been admiring moths. And this was a great opportunity. A lot of people have never been to Moundville. So we did that for the first two years there. Started off, I think the first year we had about 75 people. Mm -hmm. Next year we doubled that. And then we decided, hey, let's try this in Tuscaloosa. The moths might not be as good, but I bet if it's someplace that's more visible. Now, Manville, while it's only 15 miles south of Tuscaloosa, a lot of people just don't want to go out there in the middle of the night uh, to look at moths. So we decided, since we have the Transportation Museum as part of the UA Museum family, let's try it there. Uh, so we did that in 2018 for the first time. That was the first year we actually worked with the Tuscaloosa Public Library. I mean, we're obvious partners since they're right across the street, right across Queen City Avenue. So that was the first year uh, Tuscaloosa Public Library was involved. I think they did a reading activity and uh, it was our first year. And then I think we had over 300 people showed up. So it was the first year that Tuscaloosa News came out, photographed it. Um, and we were like, wow, this is, it, it did work. It was much more popular having in town. I don't think personally, I don't think the law, there were as many interesting malls. That was fine. There were other activities. Uh, and then we kind of brainstormed a little bit. It's like, could we continue to build this? And that's where we really thought about, let's expand it beyond malls. Um, John Abbott, who's a, a, a member of our museum staff, he's an entomologist. He has done similar large festivals in Austin, Texas, before he came here. And potentially some of these festivals draw thousands of people. So the idea was, well, let's start growing in that direction. And the first step was to kind of broaden the scope. So we made it all bugs. Um, we wanted something that rhymed with Bama, you know, Bama Bug Fest. There wasn't an existing film in the state, so we saw a real opportunity. So that's how it got started. And, and 2019 was the first year we had a true Bama Bug Fest. We had our logo designed, and we were blown away. I think we were over 1,300 people. We lost count. There were so many people. We really lost count. And, and we were pretty sure this year, had things gone as originally planned, we would easily double our number. We were actually talking about closing down Queen City Avenue, expanding into the Tuscaloosa Public Library's property. So we think it has that kind of growth potential. 
And then lo and behold, COVID-19 shows up and completely threw us uh, an obstacle. But we responded with a virtual fest and I've been really pleased with the outcome of it. Um, we've been super creative. I think we'll always continue probably in the future, even though I want to get back to having a large public event, some virtual aspect of it because uh, some of the things we've been doing with uh, cosplayers and comic books and people that we probably couldn't get to come to Tuscaloosa that we can involve in our activities. So uh, that's kind of a short, brief history in just a few years, but we went from a small festival that just focused on malls in Moundville to a really broad arthropod, any kind of bug festival in Tuscaloosa in a, in a high profile spot. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for um, going, uh, reviewing that, that origin story. It's um, it was, it, it was so much fun to have this event move to the Transportation Museum and under normal circumstances that would, um, we would actually also have an exhibit that was specific to, um, right. specific to bugs that you can find in the local area. And on more than one occasion, we, um, we at the Transportation Museum have received the question, well, you're a history museum. Why do you have bugs up here? And I've said, well, not only are we the location for the uh, upcoming Bama Bug Fest, but as the local history museum, we think it's important to showcase local bugs as well, because without our ecosystem, there's no mm -hmm. history. And um, and one particular year, I always make sure that there are pollinators included in the exhibit because pollinators transport uh, from one place to another. And without them, we also wouldn't have history because everything would fall apart because pollinators are so um, so incredibly important to us. And on more than one occasion, I've had um, I've had visitors look at me afterwards and go, "You've really thought about this." At which point, I said, "Yes, yeah, that's my job." Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's um, again, there's a lot there's a lot of creativity that goes into uh, into museum work for anyone who is. Um, interested in how it all fits together. So um, we figure out how to have a specific bug exhibit at the local history museum, not only for the, right. um, the event itself, but also because right. it's it's a local it's a local aspect that we um, we feel is um, is also our responsibility to share. So I think that's a really important point. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people think, well, we're going to focus on the biology, and we certainly do a lot of that. But what I realize is um, whether people realize it or not. All aspects of our lives, um, whether it's hist history, art, um, there's inspiration. We've got a segment coming up next week about fashion and the use of insects and in fashion for dyes and fabrics. Um, a lot of people just don't realize the connections that are there, and there is history. Um, Alabama has a bowl weevil monument. This was a agricultural pest that affected one of the most important crops in Alabama historically. Uh, cotton. So, you know, it's one of these things we can talk about, you know, oh, you know, bugs are kind of cool from the biology aspect, and they certainly are, but we use bugs, we rely on them for crops, we rely on them for so many things, and I think this is an opportunity to remind people of that. And I really like the intersections where you bring a little bit of biology, a little bit of history, maybe some cultural aspects, you know, we've got into comic books this year, movies. Um, I just love seeing that because I think this is kind of a a common place where we can all come together. So you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be someone who's a bug nerd. Uh, there's something for everybody in our festival. And we really strive to do that. Uh, whether it's kids, I think all of us probably remember, oh, when I was really young, I remember like, you know, going outside and playing with bugs and it was something I enjoyed. And then in our culture, through, as we get older, we generally get discouraged. Many bugs have kind of their ickiness, it's their, you've got cooties, you know, don't mess with bugs. So I think that that kind of natural curiosity gets squashed. There's a good point for you. But uh, the idea is I think this is an opportunity to rekindle that. And I love when we see, we get young kids here and the young kids activities, um, you know, everything from just learning about their backyard. That's why I said, you know, my whole goal is I want to get kids excited about bugs because then they get their parents excited about bugs. I mean, and last year when, you know, seeing families together, where the kids were so into it, you know, the opportunity to pick up a big hissing cockroach, you know, and their mom and dad might be completely grossed out by it, but a little, <laughs> you know, five-year-old kid was so, I mean, it was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. And, I, you know, the idea is we have cool bugs like that in our backyard. You don't have to go across the world to see these. We have some really neat examples. 
example. So that aspect, you know, you know, we live in an incredibly biodiverse state, and in particular, our bugs are really diverse. So this is an opportunity to showcase them in many ways. We had a um, we had a um, a specific question from um, uh, that was submitted by uh, Mar Martha Anderton, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, she stated, "I don't see as many moths around as I did six years ago. What's going on, John? You have a do yeah, you have so an answer for that? I've, I can kind of speak to that. I, I'm not sure I can give you the exact answer. You know, saying exactly why that is the case. Um, there are several possibilities." Um, on a global scale, there have been documented declines in insect populations, and this is primarily due to human activities, um, removal of habitat, use of pesticides, increased numbers of artificial lights and light pollution. Um, all these things combined interfere with the normal cycle of insects. So that's one possibility that some of that's happening. Um, the other thing, there are normal cycles of insects. There's some, there are periods where certain species are super abundant and then years where they're not. Sometimes it's tied to how much rainfall we have, the, the temperatures during the year. So it's a complex pattern. So it's hard on a short-term scale to say exactly why it is. Um, I've noticed it myself where I live. And, and my kind of anecdote is um, since I moved here, they spray for mosquitoes in my neighborhood. And I dread the sound of the fogging or misting truck that spring insecticides that comes through the streets and they're doing that to kill the mosquitoes. I understand that. But the reality is that those same pesticides not only kill mosquitoes, they potentially kill other things like moths. Um, the same way if people are cutting down trees to development, they're removing the food source for some species of moths. So there's, there's a lot of factors that can contribute to it. So um, I'm not sure specifically why in this particular case, uh, this person is noticing this, maybe tied to some of these, but there are lots of causes. So again, you know, those are the kind of things I think about a lot. Um, and you know, that's why I encourage people to monitor their moths because I think now I have a much, a much more in, 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 sen in, in, in sync with natural cycle of insects. Um, so there's some moth species which only appear in early in the spring. There's others that are all summer long and since I've been doing this for several years now, I at least have like a personal diary. I can go back and say, you know what? It's not just my memory. I actually saw more, more of this species a couple of years ago. And that's what I really like about uh, projects where uh, people s report that what they observe because you might be having a little website internet code. better there's, there's understanding for what if these things are really changing and then maybe why their numbers are going down we actually have a comment that was just submitted along what you were saying uh, uh donna donna cobb said it's proven to not work and kills so many other great insects and um i believe yeah. she's referring to the the spraying that you're that you're talking about so yeah like i said i recommend in my talk you know there's things you can do yourself as a homeowner or wherever you're living to reduce the ha in mosquitoes selectively, you know, removing standing water. I mentioned there are kind of very specific um, products you can buy that only kill mosquitoes. There's a bacterium that to standing water that will only kill mosquito larvae. It's not gonna kill other aquatic insects, tadpoles, harmless to other things. Those types of things are very targeted. I generally recommend people use those rather than kind of one size fits all. Insecticides, bug zappers are another one that really are not selective. So, you know, in general, and also wearing bug repellent, you know, just keeping the bugs off you is another possibility. So those are all kind of recommendations rather than just kind of doing large scale use of insecticides. That's a good question though, um, because I have now realized I haven't really seen a lot of moths lately either. So I haven't thought about that. That's a good question. Yeah. So it's, they're out there. I mean, a lot of it, you know, sometimes they're very patchy. You know, there are some nights, I mean, there's some nights where I get no moths. The next night I get a ton of them. A lot of it has to do with um, the moon phase, um, whether it's cloudy or not. Uh, again, I mentioned in my talk, a lot of moths and other insects use moonlight to navigate. Um, so to, when there's a, when there's, generally when there's a full moon, it's not a good night for having, or at least attracting moths with lights. It's the best nights are when there's no moon and when it's cloudy. 
Um, so the only lights they're seeing are kind of artificial lights. So you're more likely to see them then. I can't help but think um, this is this is going back a couple of years, but um, in the movie A Bug's Life, um, when uh, <laughs> when Flick first goes to uh, you know to the big you know to the big city, he leaves the ant hill and he's gone to the big city and he he's you know making his way in and there's a there's a bug zapper hanging up and there are two um, I guess they're moths that kind of fly up and one of them gets a little too close and turns and looks and just like goes right toward him. The friend is going, no, no, don't look at it. Don't look toward the light. And he goes, I can't help it. It is so beautiful. <laughs> he just like flies right into it. And anyway, it's, it's um, yeah. Um, I can't, anytime we talk about moths and zappers, I always picture that scene in, in my head. Um, <laughs> a little bit of humor there from Pixar, but it's. Uh, what a great movie. <laughs> it, absolutely. It makes me want to go back and watch it again. I know, actually, you know what, um, everybody, everybody take a, a couple of hours this evening and um, dig, dig, out, dig out the DVD, plug the DVD player back in and watch a bunch of that. <laughs> <laughs> or a VHS if that if people still have it. You get bonus points if you watch it on VHS. So, you know, all around for VHS. Um, but yes, for anybody that um, that has not yet seen that, it's a fantastic movie, and please, please go watch it. Um, so uh, that's our that's our cultural reference, I guess, so far this evening. Um, I do. We do have a, a very specific question um, from Big Papa Joshi that says, "Which local insects are edible, and which are the best tasting?" So we do have a segment uh, coming up about. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious. What do y'all think? Yeah, I mean, this is something, this is actually a subject that we've got one segment coming on. We're not dealing with local insects, but mm -hmm. something uh, particularly the abbots are very passionate about, and I have an interest in, is entomophagy, the eating of insects. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the ways, you know, we, we, we're celebrating insects, but in many cultures, insects are a regular food item. They're not particularly in, in U.S. culture, but in many other cultures, um, insects, you know, Grasshopper tacos are really popular in Mexico. Um, in the spider episode, someone asked about eating fried spider. It's a delicacy in Cambodia. Many other cultures um, embrace it. And I, it was kind of funny for us, as you know, many people kind of turn their nose up. Again, this gets to the idea that insects in our culture and arthropods in general are kind of considered to be disgusting. But then I remind people, hmm, do you like shrimp? How about some, you know, lobster smothered in butter or, you know, crawdads or crayfish? You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I love that. I love, well, so, you know, you're eating crustaceans and they're basically arthropods and they're not that different than, you know, eating a cricket or a grasshopper or a spider. So uh, myself, I haven't sampled intentionally. I've, I probably have eaten, you know, the reality is all of <laughs> We've us We've all probably insects. eat them, yeah. <laughs> all kind of food products, there is a minimum level of insect bits. So if you eat anything that involves grain, any kind of plant material, um, when they harvest that grain, they're harvesting insects in, as well. And they get ground up and in your flower, there are little bits of bugs that were living in that wheat field. Or so you're eating bugs all the time. You just don't perceive it. So, you know, the idea is, you know, no one's, everyone's eating a bug. Um, but you can definitely eat whole bugs. I mean, a lot of people, I, I raise mealworms. I, mean, I thought about actually trying to consume some myself, but you can definitely eat those. Crickets are another one that are raised commercially. Um, but I don't know so much about um, local insects. There probably are. I mean, there are some insects that produce nasty chemicals. So I think the idea is I, I would do a little bit of homework and say, okay, this is a, um, a bug that I don't want to eat because I know it produces some nasty chemical. Like you don't want to eat fireflies. That's one I could probably recommend staying away from. Um, but most other things are generally, if they were cooked, probably would present no problem. Uh, as long as you had no kind of objection to eating them, but a lot of grasshoppers, I imagine, big lubber grasshoppers, I'm pretty sure those are edible. Um, any other things? Um, even some moths you could probably eat. Um, I've eaten, for example, caterpillar larvae, big caterpillars potentially uh, are edible. Again, you, you know, you just want to do your research to make sure they don't, they're not, they're not venomous caterpillars that might have hairs that might upset you. So that's a really good question. And then maybe that's for a future Bama bug. Maybe we could have a competition for someone to, you know, 
we do things with crickets and mealworms, but maybe think about a local um, insect that we could definitely eat. And I, I've never really thought about it, but that's a really good um, question because, you know, there might be a local insect that could potentially be raised. Um, um, black soldier flies, for example, are something else that a lot of people are raising now as a food product. So there are probably some potential things out there, but they may need a little refinement. And again, you know, tweaking the recipe. Um, it vary, you know, insects vary a lot in their nutritional qualities. Um, some are have higher protein, some have higher fat. So I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I, that's a really good question. I'm going to think about it a little bit. So thanks for asking it. I think the. Of, oh, go ahead, Haley. I was just going to say, you brought up at the beginning how people turn their nose up to it. I mean, I can think about any competition show that I've watched, and at least some segment in there, they're having to eat some insect and somebody's crying. So it is kind of an interesting, interesting to think, think about. I and think I think the most watched segments on Survivor. Yes. Survivor. <laughs> Allie, go ahead. I, say, I think uh, as long as uh, I think what we all want to walk away with is we're not encouraging you to just go outside and eat whatever you find on the ground. Please do right. research yeah. before you go outside and eat whatever you find on the ground. Well, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's like everything <laughs> else. It's like, you know, well, I, I have no problem with someone eating it. like I would, again, recommend people um, know what it is before you eat it. Um, like I said, there's some beetles you could pop in your mouth, crunch, they're done. But there are other ones, if you did that, you might. I don't think you might get sick. sick there's some that, I um, mean, there's like bombardier beetles. There are some other beetles that produce some nasty chemicals. But, you know, in most cases, you probably would spit them out. You'd realize this tastes horrible. I don't <laughs> want to taste this. Um, so, like, for example, I actually have a beetle here that I was showing earlier to the group. I don't know if people can yeah. see that. Um, this is actually, this is a female stag beetle. So our logo is a male stag beetle. So this is... Yeah. Um, a female of that species. It doesn't have the jaws that are quite as big. Let me get it up here. Yeah, there you go. Allie's um, Allie's wore the logo on her shirt today. <laughs> and, and Allie uh, thinks we should call it Stella. So I'm not going to eat Stella. I'm going to release her. But Stella uh, when I was out looking for moths <laughs> last night, I saw this. So there are all kinds. Besides moths out now, there are all kinds of cicadas are out in force. I saw lots of cicadas last night. They're all over the streets this morning when I was out walking with my dogs. So. There, it's peak season for bugs right now. So definitely, if you have any interest, um, when you, if you put a light out, I mean, things besides moths will come as well. Uh, sometimes you get, I get walking sticks, I get pregnancies, um, all kinds of really cool things. So uh, if you see any cool bugs, again, take a picture, post them on social media, with the hashtag Banner Bug Fest, and you can win some free stickers. So, yes, absolutely. We love put Stella back. She's, love. she's, we love, love, love some of that, uh, what is it called, citizen science? Is that the correct term for uh, non-scientists doing? Yeah, citizen science, community science. science. It's kind of, you know, informal science. Informal. Where you as, a, you as a citizen or a community member can contribute an observation. And the idea is, you know, alone it's not a lot, but when you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people do that, you get amazing data sets that actually are greater than any one scientist could get so i get i get contact all the time i actually have right now last night i recorded a moth that um, someone contacted me immediately they're like if you see more can you see one we want it for our insect collection and we want to get dna out of it i have another i have a graduate student at virginia tech who's sending me um, a kit to collect millipedes because she, because of covid she can't travel to do her research so i i by showing these things out, you actually, I directly and indirectly get to contribute to research. So I love that aspect of it because, you know, I learned something, I get to help out a fellow scientist. So you might be surprised how people will use your data. You might just be interested in saying, you know, what is this bug? And it might be a super common bug, but you'd be surprised. You may find something that is not very well known, or you may observe it doing something that's never been observed before. Um, there are uh, species, we don't have them yet, but spotted land flies are a big problem now in the Northeast. They started in Pennsylvania and they're spreading out and they damage agricultural crops. They're really distinctive and people are posting pictures of them and helping to document how far they're spreading out. I mean, they may eventually get to Alabama, but they're not here yet. So watch out for those and um, murder hornets, right? 
The murder hornets. Yeah, I'm really surprised I didn't get more murder. I should be murder hornet questions because I, I think what happened is COVID nineteen just knocked it out of headlines. It was, yeah. you know, it was on CNN, and then COVID nineteen showed up, and we haven't heard any more about the murder hornets. Well, maybe maybe that's their plan all along, though. They don't want to be heard about until they come and get you. <laughs> they're in <cahoots>. they're, they're, <laughs> they're 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 cheeky. They're cheeky creatures. Uh, but, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps that'll be uh, something that can be so, be discussed a little bit more on the on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday is the Pollinators Day, and um, from what I remember reading and hearing about the murder hornets, is that yes, they could be problematic to humans, but the real thing that we needed to be concerned about was the fact that they their real target is uh, bees and beehives. Um, so maybe that's something that uh, that can be discussed a bit further on um, on Tuesday on Pollinator Day. Um, I do have a quick question, actually, for uh, for Allie um, from the insect iconography and storytelling segment. Um, yeah. Allie, Dr. Jim Knight shared a little of his expertise about iconography at Moundville. Um, can you talk a little bit about that segment and uh, share if anything in particular piqued your interest? Yeah, so um, it was fascinating. I'd always heard about and have seen the pictures of the the moth creature, um, but it was nice to kind of get a little bit more, um, I don't know, description about it. But, you know, Dr. Knight says that, and he, he, only, he only had three vessels to show, or three objects to show us that had insect iconography on it. Um, and there was one that looked like it could possibly be a beetle type creature, and then there was two that looked like they one had like the full of what they think is the moth type creature and the other one had parts of the moth type creature um on it and i thought my you know I, I guess i always thought i understood what iconography was and i had a pretty decent understanding of it but i really appreciated him taking time to kind of really explain it and i had this question that i asked him about whether or not iconography was akin to like a system of writing you know or like to to convey and he he said it was fascinating he said that you know we're not supposed to think about these because they're not telling a narrative or they're not you know writing down the receipt for however many things you sold to your neighbor or trade traded to your neighbor or whatever they are you know everything that's depicted in the moundville museum is of religious significance and has religious purpose and so the things that we're looking at it's not a moth that's based off of a moth that somebody just sat down and was like you know drawing a picture of a moth it's it's a spiritual being that was you know potentially based off of moths or based off of beetles um that have significant in, that are you know something from the spirit realm not something from our physical realm here um which you know, I've heard a couple of times, but it's really nice to kind of have that put in front of you again to keep that in the forethought and your in your you know at the beginning of your brain, at the head of your brain, because you know going into it, I think you want to you want to have it have like a real world solid real world counterpart, and it's it's kind of it it isn't exactly that way, and I, I kind of love that about it is that it has that religious and and spiritual significance to it. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting. If you guys haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you go back and check it out. Um, I haven't watched it yet. Did you, did you talk much about, you know, I, I know a little bit about it because like I said, we, we did the, the Virgil Moth Fest. I, I kind of got really interested in the moth creature and kind of what its connections were to Native American culture because um, my understanding is, you know, you think about the life cycle of a moth. I mean, it really is kind of magical. If you didn't know the biology behind it, how does something that goes in, if you've seen, um, you know, the cat, the caterpillar for one of these hawk moths that it's kind of, I think it's probably the moth that it's based on, you know, how that goes from this kind of fat plump little caterpillar to this really aerodynamic, um, hawk moths. If you've never seen them are just amazing flyers. They're just mm -hmm. incredibly fast. They have really pr precision, you know, that transformation must've been, you know, I can imagine someone who didn't completely understand their life cycle. Um, being just in awe of that connection. How do you go from this to that? And then the fact that they, you know, at least the adult the hawk moths, they almost certainly knew pollinated one of their very important um, medicinal plants, tobacco. Um, so tobacco is pollinated by a sphinx moth, one of these hawk moths, you know, that they had some, because, you know, without the pollinators, you don't get more tobacco, um, mm -hmm. you know, plants. So 
I think that to them must have been also kind of very magical, you know. And I think sometimes myself, you know, if I didn't have the training that I have in biology, you know, I could be in awe of so many things I see in nature are really are magical. You just like, how do these things interconnect? And but you realize they play a really important role. So I've always been fascinated by it. And I realize it's, you know, they're not trying to just explain the biology, but I think that's part of it. Plus their own kind of beliefs about the afterworld. Um, but I like, I just love that they picked a moth for that because, and it's 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 a Moundville thing. Um, you know, the rattlesnake disc gets a lot of love, and it should. But I think the moth disc is as interesting, and probably most people aren't aware of it, but. You know, you can see it right there in the Jones Museum. Uh, if you go to Mount Biological Park. And I think one of my favorite parts about the story is that, you know, they had been studying that. So on the disc, there are several different, uh, I guess, types of imagery that are all, it's on the same disc, but there's obviously separate different ones. Like there's two hands with what would be the hand and eye, but he said it really wasn't the hand and eye, but it looks like it. Um, and an arrow figuring and then some like rope thing with two faces in the middle. But he said that for a while on the disc that they sort of just didn't think about the moth, what was now the moth creature. Um, Cause they, you know, it, they thought it was just maybe, you know, could potentially just be a grouping of, of symbols or grouping of, of artwork or, you know, just put it in kind of a random order or not random necessarily, but in order they didn't recognize. And then they finally were talking about it and discovered that it looked a little bit like, um, had very similar characteristics to a, a moth creature in southeastern, or uh, in Georgia, southeastern Georgia, and um, somewhere in Georgia. And uh, that was very much more, like you could definitely tell that was, that was a moth there. And they had similar characteristics between the two um, that they said that they, when they finally figured that out and then they went to some of the, the Native American community to ask, you know, what they would think that this moth might be. And that is where they discovered the connection to the Sphinx moth because of the tobacco plant. And so it's not just like, you know, uh, people like Dr. Knight who are studying these images and, and putting them in context and trying to understand their meaning. But it was also a great, I like that story because it was a great uh, collaborative sort of effort between mm -hmm. lots of different communities to try to understand what this thing from 800 years ago meant, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think I know if you were mm -hmm. interested in finding out more about Moundville, I know that I have seen Moundville books at the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Is that right, Haley? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I've seen, um, and I, I think I'm pretty sure that there's, there's a couple of really incredible books that I've read personally um, about not just, you know, not ones that are specifically written about Moundville, but also ones that are written about um, like Mississippian culture and Southeastern Native Americans. And I believe if I remember correctly that I have seen a, a pretty decent section of them at the Tuscaloosa. And I've only seen them at the main branch, but I've only really gone to the main branch. So there might be more at the other branches too, I guess. <laughs> but it's a good resource for everyone who wants to learn a little bit more about Moundville. Yeah, I think. absolutely. I was going to tell you, Allie, one of my, excuse me, one of my favorite things about the uh, moth this, the, the moth creature, is that you can see its proboscis. Mm -hmm. and it clearly has a proboscis, it's, which is, it's like, you know, I showed an image of mine of the sphinx moth, yeah, that they can curly. stick out to pollinate the flowers. And if you've mm -hmm. ever seen a tobacco flower, it's kind of a deep white flower. The other thing, which I don't think, I, don't, I, didn't, I haven't watched Dr. Knight's segment, but a lot, a lot of people don't realize is um, the same moth that we have that pollinates tobacco, it's a native species, is also what we call a tobacco hornworm. So tobacco and tomatoes are in the same family. So this is something that uh, we consider a pest now. So, you know, those big green honking caterpillars that if you have tomato plants, you despise because they will quickly devour. That turns into the hawk moth that also pollinates tobacco and um, tomatoes. And obviously tomato, you know, tobacco, um, I can't remember the origins of it, um, but it was here much earlier than tomatoes. I don't believe mm -hmm. were introduced until much later. So the idea is, you know, now you know, modern culture looks at those as a pest, and, and you know, the, I just love the idea that the, the Native Americans actually worship these animals. You know, this is a case where, again, kind of how I think in our culture, bugs get a bad rap. You know, and yeah, they yeah they're going to damage your tomatoes, but they do a lot of other good. And I, I really like that contrast of how just the same animal. This animal is the same animal. Um, what's changed is the people that are occupying this part of Alabama. You know, people that used to revere it, you know, 
now a different group of people think it's oh this is a pest. So I just I just love that aspect of it, you know, that uh, and reminding people of that because I think people like don't realize that when they say oh this is one and the same animal. Yeah, per perspective certainly has a has a lot to a lot to to do with it. And um, Dr. Knight has published several books on um, the research that he has um, that he has completed in and around uh, Moundville Archaeological Park um, over the the course of, of his career. And he he's he's absolutely fantastic. And I'm I'm so glad he was able to to be a part of of bug fest this year and, and share the knowledge that um that he has on on iconography because he he is he's a very very knowledgeable individual so um if, if anyone if, again if anyone's interested in looking into more details about that dr knight has several published books about moundville about the mississippian culture and um and and how iconography uh, works um in in and around those those topics and uh, that that area. So please, everybody, go check out Dr. Jim Knight um, and some of his uh, some of his publications. Um, I think we'll um, think we'll have just uh, maybe one more question. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna jump back to the two o'clock segment. And uh, John, you mentioned in that segment that there are over 180,000 species of Lepidoptera. Thank you, Latin. Uh, worldwide, um, that is absolutely incredible. Again, whenever I first read that, I thought. That's too many zeros. That can't be right. Um, <laughs> and you said that you've identified over 700 species just from your own backyard in Tuscaloosa. Is that is that number accurate as well? Over 700 species in your own. Backyard? Yeah, I, I have to check my life list, but I, I was a well over 600 um, last year. Or so, and like I said, I don't add new species as often. But just last night, I got a new record from my backyard for me personally. Um, so it continues. Um, so that, that is, I think, an accurate representation. So there isn't just incredible diversity locally. Um, I don't think Tuscaloosa is necessarily any more biodiverse than any other part of, the Alaba of Alabama. Um, so um, there are people out there that are in, you know, the more kind of pristine habitat you're in, the more wooded area, you're, you're generally going to get more than if you're in downtown, um, you know, Huntsville or, or, or Birmingham. But there are moths everywhere. I mean, there are moths inside our homes. Um, some, a few are pests. I mean, you, some of us, they, you know, there are moths that do eat clothing. Uh, there are moths that are agricultural pests getting the mealworms. They're all over all my kitchen cabinets right now. All of us may have had that right experience. <laughs> exactly, where you've had that experience. So those Andrew are the vast moms. minority. But everywhere there are, there are some species that are super common. Um, other ones are rarer. Um, but I, I guarantee you, you're, you can't be anywhere in Alabama. And I, if, if, if you leave a light on, you're going to get a few moths. And is there a um, do you do you have a do you have a any like wish list moths or butterflies that you would like to that you'd like like to see in nature and be able to, to capture? Yeah, I, I actually mentioned one of them. I, I I I'm trying to think of the equivalent. People talk about birds. They're like you know sometimes there's your grail bird. My grail moth right now uh, would probably be that black witch. So this was this is the largest um, moth that we get in North America. Not the heaviest I've seen the heaviest. I have gotten um, regal moths multiple times at my house, but I have not yet seen a black witch. And I, I, I met it last year, um, a friend of mine um, who goes to the same park that I do in town here, Mooney Circle Park. Um, she was out looking for snakes. That's her favorite group of animals. And she walked under a little bridge that crosses the stream in the park and noticed this big moth underneath, took a photo of it, and uh, posted it, and I said, "That's a black witch. Where is it?" She told me, "I, you know, about an hour later, I was able to get out there, and it was gone." So I was like, oh, "So close." So <laughs> I know they're here. They're not very common, but they. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe this year I'll get it eventually. Uh, but they're kind of be, they'd be unmistakable. You know, a moth that's about eight inches across is kind of unforgettable. So that's probably at the moment. There are other ones that are just rare. You know, I get excited about any new moth. Um, there are so many moths that are like super tiny. I call them micro moths, and, and some of them just are incredibly colorful. And um, so, everyone's told me I get something that's really co colorful um, that I haven't seen before. That's almost as exciting. But the one for sure that I want to see um, is that black witch. That is my kind of Moby Dick moment. If I can get out there, I want to definitely find one of those. So maybe this will be my year. If not. 
keep trying. Well, it must be it must be encouraging to know that they're actually they actually exist in the area versus you know seeing it. Well, that's what I said. That was the first one I saw. And, you know, um, yeah. but yeah, so it, it must be encouraging to at least know that they're in the area versus looking at a book and going, "Oh, that's so beautiful," and then finding out it's in like yeah. Central Asia and you know not maybe not yeah. um, you know have the the ability to get to that area perhaps yeah. as easily. But um, I've got my fingers crossed for you. I hope you yeah. I hope you find one. Um, Allie, do you have a, do you have a, a wish list moth or uh, or butterfly that um, you'd like to you'd like to see? Um, well, I thought I had an answer, but now I know that there's a chonky one out there, and I want to see the chonky one. <laughs> What's the heavy one again? What's this chonky there's name? Lots, there's lots of chonky oh, ones. I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that one. <laughs> um, well, I now know how I'm going to reverse. Most people like I'm really <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling regal today. I think a lot of people oh, know that their okay. moths tend to be the really big ones. Now, so we have several species of giant silk moth, the luna moth. Luna moths um, are the gorgeous. imperial moth, the regal yeah. moth. Uh, Polyphemus, I had one last night. Uh, tulip tree, silk moth. These are all kind of, you know, four or five inch large moths. And uh, really when you see them for the first time, a lot of people are just, you know, they may be seeing pictures but haven't realized how big they are. And, yeah. Um, a lot of people, the first time they see a lunar moth, which for me are super common, but for some people it's just like, oh my God, what have I seen? You know, there's this giant moth that showed up in my backyard. And um, so I love that experience. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's what I want. I wanted to have a very positive experience with moths. I mean, um, seeing something that's big and colorful, um, start with those. There are a lot of small brown moths that um, you'll pull your hair out trying to identify. Um, <laughs> and, but there are colorful ones out there. Um, I love the Io moths. I had one last night. That's a yellow moth that uh, they have little eyes on their hind wings. And if you poke them or blow on them gently, like they'll move their forewings and they, and they poke the eyes out. Um, and then it kind of like a starter response to a potential predator. <laughs> so I, I, I do mess with moths from time to time. Some moths <laughs> make noises. Um, you know, you, moths have personalities. There's some which like will never set still. Other ones like will play dead if you poke them. So. Yeah, I, that, that's what I'm. A, I'm just a curious biologist. I can't resist kind of. Hey, what is this? This looks different. Um, well, I'm 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 a personal fan of the the luna moth and the the sphinx moth, but um, I, I become less a fan whenever they they fly way too close to my face. Like it's just I, I want I want to observe from a distance. There actually are phobias. There there are people that are lepidophobes. I actually know someone who is that, and it's really interesting because like as I mentioned. Um, Adult moths and caterpillars, they cannot hurt you. There's right. absolutely nothing. They have no venom. There's no way to bite you. They can't sting you. A few of the caterpillars can sting you, but in general, you have absolutely nothing to fear with a moth. Um, so th that's like the one thing, if you can rationalize. But I realize these, these phobias are often not rational. Um, well, but, you know, just the, people the just don't like the fluttering. fluttering. Okay. It's more just the fluttering, like yeah. in space, and you know, it's it's that it's that whole it's that whole thing. I, I don't hold it against the moth personally, but I do prefer to observe them from afar. And if they take flight off the wall or wherever I happen to see them, I'm I, I make sure that they definitely go their direction, and then I go mine, so we don't have any kind of um, we don't have any kind of uh, collision because. Again, it's more just the flutteriness that, um, that I, I don't yeah. I don't care for. Um, I'm kind of curious. I just wonder if any of you I, I didn't mention, but were any of you butterfly snobs before I talked about? That's the other thing I kind of realized. There's there are people that and there are people that really love butterflies. I mean, they're but some of these same people just they just turn their nose up at moths. That's kind of why I really like to hit home the fact that you just like one group of moths. And that if you really like butterflies, you need to like all moths because I think they're as interesting. Some of them are as colorful, but there's some people that just, you know, if you tell them it's a moth, they don't want, you know, if I didn't see it during the day out looking for wildflowers, they're not interested, which I find kind of interesting. But there is that segment of, of, of people out there and I've experienced it, just kind of scratched my head. And so I myself, I'm always drawn to kind of more, I don't know when they say uglier, but kind of interesting where the diversity lies. Mm -hmm. And that definitely is with the bulk of moths. Butterflies are fascinating. Don't get me wrong. I like butterflies. But if I have a choice between going out and looking for butterflies or going out at night and looking for moths, I know where I'm going to be at at night looking for moths. 
one fact that that uh, that has stuck with me since we've um, you know been working on on Bugfest, uh, Bama Bugfest for the past um, two years, and then you know just previously Mothfest is that butterflies are day moths, so um, they yeah. they have a slightly different name, and so that that's one fact that has that has stuck with me personally. That you know I. I now will, I don't think ever forget that butterflies are moths. They are just a day moth versus a night moth, which is what I think most people yep. are just kind of more naturally. And there, there are, there are some other day moths. I mean, they're not as common, but um, the bulk of day moths are, are butterflies, but there are examples. I gave that great kind of in my quiz today, that little trick one that, you know, if you didn't know what that would be, it looks for all the world like a butterfly, but it in fact is a moth. So, you know, again, uh, you know, so I, I tell people, you know, you can, you know, there's 700 species of butterflies, but there's 1,000 species. Of so uh, I'm, I'm really driven by diversity. And I, you know, I think hopefully people, when you run out of, run out of butterflies, you know where to go next. And uh, Haley, do you have a, uh, a particular moth or butterfly that you would like to be being being a more more of a butterfly day moth person is there a particular <laughs> one that you'd like to see um if, if you could see one out in the wild or have the the ability, the ability to do that is there one in particular that um you'd like to see well so i guess and this is probably because i see them in my backyard but i really love the swallowtail butterflies um i don't know i just think that their shape is so unique um and I, I guess i think it's the eastern tiger one that i see often but it's yellow does that mean it's a female it's all yellow and it has black no, they're, actually they're, they're two different morphs there's actually most of them are yellow i think there's also a black morph Once in a while you'll see one that if you look at a field guide there's two color morphs the yellow is by far the more common um, and that's the one I typically see here, you know, and they're, they're rather big showy moths and they're kind of hard to miss. You'll see them. Um, you know, there are some small butterflies. I mean, not all butterflies are big. There's, there's a lot of butterflies that are quite tiny, um, that, you know, only about an inch long. And those ones are, you know, a lot of the skipper moths are small. Some of them are brown. Um, yeah. but then there's big showy moths like the swallowtails, um, and they're, you know, pipevine swallowtails, um, the eastern swallowtails. There's actually a, a giant swallowtail, zebra swallowtails, and there's several of them again in the state. So definitely, if you don't get a butterfly guide, like I recommended them, um, you know, check out the Butterflies of Alabama website. It really is just a gold mine of information um, that was a, a kind of a, a passion for people, local butterfly enthusiasts that started and just documenting records, and they keep county records. And again, they've been doing it for I think decades now. So they're really good records for butterflies, much better than there are for moths. Um, and there are people that, um, they're actually, a, I know a couple that go out every weekend and they will go all over the state to places because there are some butterflies that are really rare and often they have really specific uh, host plants and they will go out and they know, okay, I know there's this plant growing there. Let's go back at the right time of year and see if they're there. And they'll sometimes find caterpillars, go back a couple of weeks later and hopefully find, you know, uh, chrysalis. And then a couple of weeks later to see the uh, adults emerging. So there's a passionate group of butterfly people out there. I mean, they're not as numerous as burgers, but they're definitely out there. Yeah. And I, so I, I did a project a couple of years back on the pipe vine or the zebra. So as one that I've always wanted to see, I know that it's not as fun as the chunky moth, but, but, but <laughs> it is know, equally I, as fun. <laughs> I thought it was so beautiful and it's always stuck with me. I, I've seen yellow ones, but I, I'm really, I want to see a zebra or a pot vine. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, as I recall, I'm, I'm, now I may be not, I'm, I think this, this is the case, I'm not, but I think zebra, so I think they're, they're the ones that feed on pawpaw trees. So again, mm -hmm. this is one of these cases where you got to find places where they're pawpaw trees. That, I think that's true. Um, okay. The same, like I, I love the Gulf fritillaries and they love passion vine. So I've got passion vine in my backyard that um, it, it, it's booming this year and I haven't seen any caterpillars yet, but I know they're going to show up and they will completely decimate it, but it comes back every year. Um, so that's why I told, I mentioned in my talk, you know, if there's certain butterflies you like, it really is helpful to figure out what their host plants are because females are going to be looking for those plants to lay their eggs on. Um, yeah. And then you can also plant uh, plants that produce nectar for butterflies. There are some plants like lantana, which um, just all kinds of butterflies like to feed on. So there are, you can both plants that they want to feed on as well as plants that they want to lay their eggs on. You get those in your yard 
um, you'll get the butterflies that you want. John, you'll be glad to know I'm not just a butterfly snob. I got excited when I saw a yellow moth the other day too. So <laughs> I don't mind them fluttering my face. I don't know. It's kind of like a little uh, Disney movie. It feels like they just look at the form. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you have that kind of relationship with your moths, Haley, because I definitely <laughs> <laughs> might help you do chores around the house. It's what I'm kind of under the impression of. I'm like, maybe, let's just be nice. Maybe they'll help me dust at some point. <laughs> now, little- Catherine, because you have a toddler of the same age as mine, um, is he into PJ masks at all? No, he's he's you know, the not. Series, the um, oh, no. he isn't because there's a there's a character there called Lunar Girl, and she uh-huh. has moths are like her little helpers. And uh, it's, it's a great character. I mean, she's kind of a villain, but she has this, these moths help her do things. They're kind of her like her little army when she needs help. Well, See, Kevin, you- be nice to them. See, you got to um, be nice. I'm always nice. I always respect their space. And then apparently for some reason, I don't know, maybe I smell too good, but they just always just seek me out and just kind of like, thank you very much, but please go <laughs> away. <laughs> Um, well, we are, we are right at an hour, everybody. Thank you so much for, um, for all of the, the commentary. Thank you for the, the great questions that we, um, we got. Um, I think it's um, probably a, might be a good idea to wrap up for today. So I want to thank you all again for joining us for Bama Buckfest on the web. Make sure to check us out on Tuesday, July 21st for Pollinators, a day dedicated to programs about some of the most important insects to us. As always, content appears at 10, 2, and 4 with the daily wrap up at, daily wrap up at 7, and all times are central. Um, if you aren't able to join us for the live presentations, you can always go back and watch them later as archive videos on our social media sites, YouTube channels, and linked in our handy resource guide, which is a wealth of information and uh, covers pretty much everything that has been happening now um, over the past two weeks that uh, Bama Bug Fest on the web has been um, been taking place. So many thanks to Lance of uh, Rogers Library for, for compiling that for us. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of our event partners, social media sites, and YouTube channels. As always, we want to thank um, UA Museums, the Warner Transportation Museum, the Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Department of Research and Collections at UA, UA's Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library for all of your work in organizing this event. Thank you to our guests. Um, John, Allie, and Haley for joining us uh, tonight and helping us out today. We appreciate you sharing a little of your time and expertise with us tonight. Thank you so much. Everybody tune back in again on Tuesday, July 21st for Pollinators. In the meantime, have a fantastic night and a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. All right. Stella says bye-bye. <laughs> bye, Stella. Bye, Stella. Bye, Stella. <laughs>